In this module, we will look at the four main types of biomolecules. Biomolecules are very large molecules produced by cells and living organisms and are essential for life. They are typically made from linking together repeating building blocks, referred to as monomers. The resulting biomolecule ends up being a supermolecule and is described as being a polymer or macromolecule. You can think of these polymers as a strong chain made from connecting metal links together or a train of connected freight cars. The polymers that will be seen in this video are made from monomers linked together through a chemical reaction known as a dehydration synthesis. So whenever monomers are linked together, new covalent bonds are formed and water molecules are removed in the process. For this reason, the reaction is also known as a condensation reaction. In this example here, the monomers A and B are linked together to form the polymer AB. And in the reaction, the hydrogen from monomer A and the hydroxyl group from monomer B will combine together to form water. There are four major types of biomolecules found in living organisms. They are proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and lipids. We will have a closer look at the types of polymers in these four categories and the monomers they are made from. We will first look at proteins. They are long chains made up of monomers called amino acids. In the human body, there are 20 essential amino acids that contain carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms. There are a couple of amino acids that also contain sulfur. What you see here is the general structure of all amino acids. There is an amine group, as well as a carboxylic acid group. And so together, they make up the name amino acid. There's also a hydrogen atom, as well as a side chain group, referred to as the R group. It is the different R groups that distinguish one amino acid from another, giving each its own chemical properties. Here are the 20 essential amino acids. And you can see that all of the R groups are different from one another. They can be nonpolar, polar, or electrically charged. And the charge can be positive, such as the example shown here, or they can be negative, such as these two examples shown here. The various structural features in the R groups allows for different types of intermolecular interactions to occur. And those interactions are important in the folding and the 3D shape of proteins, which in turn is important in biological processes. Amino acids can be linked together through a dehydration synthesis that involves the amine end of one amino acid so we have amine end here, linking together with a carboxylic acid group of a neighboring amino acid. The result is the formation of a covalent bond called a peptide bond. There's also a formation and release of a water molecule. When there are more than three amino acids linked together, the resulting polymer is called a polypeptide. When more than 100 amino acids are linked together, the polymer is referred to as a protein. Proteins have very diverse roles in living organisms. They can be enzymes which facilitate chemical reactions. Without the enzymes, living things would cease to exist as all of the chemical reactions in the biological system would be too slow. They can move other molecules around such as oxygen, as well as carry information such as hormones. Proteins like antibodies help to fight foreign substances in the organism, such as harmful bacteria. Protein found in muscles help with movement. They are also found in cell walls and connective tissues. And proteins help to maintain the blood pH. Without them, there could be large changes in the pH, which could be detrimental and life-threatening. There are four levels of protein structure. The first level is based on several amino acids linked together through the formation of peptide bonds. 
The second level involves hydrogen bonding between amino acids at different points in the peptide chain. The two main types of secondary structure is the alpha helix, which resembles a coil, and the beta sheets, which look like pleated sheets. The hydrogen bonding is indicated by the dashed orange lines. The third level involves more complex coiling and folding incorporating the alpha helix and the beta sheets to give the final three-dimensional shape. The interactions involved in the folding include hydrogen bonds, disulfide bonds, hydrophobic interactions, as well as electrostatic interactions. Electrostatic interactions would be considered ionic bonds formed between the R groups that have uh, positive charges with the R groups that have negative charges. The only covalent bonding involved in the folding of the protein structure would be the disulfide bonds formed between non-adjacent amino acids that have R groups containing sulfur atoms. The fourth level involves interactions between two or more folded polypeptide chains to create a protein complex. Here we have a protein folding into its tertiary structure. Notice that it has the alpha helixes and the beta sheets. The yellow lines that appear are the intermolecular interactions. And so those intermolecular interactions can be hydrogen bonding, it could be ionic bonding, hydrophobic interactions, or disulfide bonds. Another major category of biomolecules is carbohydrates, which is probably pretty familiar to everyone as it makes up a large part of our diets. They are long chains of simple sugars made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. The carbohydrate would be considered the polymer, and the simple sugar, also known as a monosaccharide, would be considered the monomer. Here are some common known simple sugars glucose, fructose, and galactose. You can see that they're very similar in structure, except for the size of the rings, as they could have five atoms, or it could have six atoms in the rings. Another difference is um, the position of the hydroxyl groups. Because of the shaded lines in the rings, what it tells us that the rings are actually sitting perpendicular to the screen so they are essentially pointing out towards you. This means that the hydroxyl groups that are pointing downwards are actually sitting below the ring. And the hydroxyl groups that are pointing upwards here are all sitting above the ring. Although these examples show a ring structure, these monosaccharides are only found in living systems. In non-living systems, the sugars are typically in an open chain form. Just like in protein, sugar molecules can also be linked together through a dehydration synthesis. By removing water from connecting two sugar molecules, a new covalent bond is formed. This bond is called a glycosidic bond or linkage. When two sugars are linked together, they form a disaccharide. Many of the foods we eat contain disaccharides. For example, sucrose, which is table sugar. It comes from glucose and fructose linked together. Lactose, which is found in milk, comes from linking glucose with galactose. When more than two sugars are linked together, the carbohydrate can be referred to as a polysaccharide. Carbohydrates are actually the most important energy source in living organisms. They're the main fuel in the human body. When polysaccharides undergo a reverse reaction where water is added to the large biomolecule, the monosaccharides are released and then distributed in the body. Eventually, they undergo a biological process that will release the energy that is stored in the bonds of the monosaccharides. Starch and cellulose are both common polysaccharides. They are both made up of glucose sugars linked together. Yet the three-dimensional shape of the polysaccharide results in only starch being water-soluble. So starch is found in many foods that we eat, potatoes, rice, flour, beans. It's water-soluble because it's in a helix form. 
That allows the hydroxyl groups to be exposed to the water, allowing it to hydrogen bond with the water. Cellulose, on the other hand, is insoluble in water. It's the major component of plants. For example, it makes up 90% of cotton. Cellulose are straight chains, and that's because of the three-dimensional shape around the glycosidic linkages. Notice that the difference between starch and cellulose is that the middle glucose molecule is flipped. So see here that the hydroxyl group is pointing upwards, and in starch, the hydroxyl group is pointing downwards. So the straight chain in cellulose allows hydrogen bonding to occur between adjacent glucose molecules, but it can also occur between parallel cellulose molecules. So picture cellulose chains up top and down below. The hydroxyl groups will no longer be exposed to the water, and so it can't hydrogen bond with the water. Rather, it's hydrogen bonding with other cellulose polysaccharides. So this is why cellulose becomes insoluble in water. It's interesting to see how a slight change in the shape around the glycosidic linkages affects the shape of the polysaccharides, and that in turn affects the water solubility. The third major category is lipids. Common lipids you would be familiar with are fats, oils, and waxes. Lipids contain long hydrocarbon chains with a carboxylic acid functional group at one end of the molecule. The hydrocarbon chain is mainly made up of carbon and hydrogen atoms and can be anywhere between 4 and 24 carbon atoms long. Although the lipids are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, they are mainly made up of carbon and hydrogen atoms in a 1 to 2 ratio. There are a small number of lipids that also contain nitrogen, phosphorus, or sulfur. There are various types of lipids. In this video, you will be briefly introduced to fatty acids, fats, cholesterol, phospholipids, and glycolipids. Lipids that have carboxylic acid group and a long hydrocarbon chain is described as a fatty acid. Here's an example of one called lauric acid, which contains 12 carbons. Despite the presence of a carboxylic acid group, which is polar, the rest of the molecule is mainly made up of carbons and hydrogens. Since carbon-hydrogen bonds are essentially nonpolar, the entire molecule is considered nonpolar. This is why lipids do not dissolve in water. Lipids have a variety of roles in living organisms, but the main roles include being a source of energy as well as a storage for energy. They are an integral part of cell structure and are needed to insulate and protect the body. They act as messengers, which include regulating body temperature and hormone levels. They also help transmit nerve impulses. We are unable to make all the lipids that our body needs, so some of it must be obtained from our diet. In particular, we have to consume fatty acids because they are needed to make other types of lipids in our body. Be aware though that not all fatty acids are considered healthy. There are three classes of fatty acids which you may already be familiar with as they are usually included in nutrition labels. There are saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. In saturated fatty acids, all the carbon-carbon bonds are single. They typically are found in hard fats such as butter. The reason is because the hydrocarbon tails can be packed closely together due to the straight chain shape, resulting in the fat being in a solid phase. So in C, if you see here in this diagram, notice how tightly packed the tails are due to the straight chain. The monounsaturated fatty acids contain one carbon-carbon double bond, which results in kinks in the hydrocarbon tail. The kinks prevent tails from being close to one another, and so these types of fats exist in a liquid state, the main example being oils. So notice in this example here, the kinks prevent the tails from being closely packed together. Lastly, 
polyunsaturated fatty acids contain more than one carbon-carbon double bond. And so they too would have kinks in the hydrocarbon tails and would be in the liquid state. You may have also heard of trans fats. This type of fat refers to the 3D shape around the carbon-carbon double bond. Trans fats are man-made fats that come from processed foods. They should be avoided because our bodies do not have an efficient way to process and eliminate them because they are man-made and not natural. It can accumulate and have negative effects on our health, such as increasing the risk of heart disease. Unlike sugars and amino acids, fatty acids cannot be strung together into a larger chain-like molecule. Instead, they are attached to a smaller molecule called glycerol through dehydration synthesis reactions to form different types of fats. The most common type of fat is a triglyceride, and if they are in a solid or a semi-solid form, they are called fats. If the triglyceride is in a liquid form, they are called oils. Glycerol is a three carbon chain with a hydroxyl group bonded to each carbon atom. So this here would be the glycerol molecule. Notice the hydroxyl groups. Through the dehydration synthesis reaction, the removal of water allows up to three fatty acids to be covalently bonded to a glycerol. The bond here is called an ester bond or an ester linkage. Depending on the number of fatty acids that are attached to the glycerol molecule, the fat can be called a monoglyceride, diglyceride, or a triglyceride. In this example here, what we're looking at is a triglyceride since three fatty acids were bonded to glycerol. Blood tests can include a measurement on triglyceride levels. Higher levels is associated to increased risk of cardiovascular diseases. Fossil lipids are an important type of lipid because they are the main component in the cell membrane, as well as membranes of organelles inside the cell. The reason they are called phospholipids is because a phosphate group here links a diglyceride with a non-lipid group. Now the non-lipid group, along with the phosphate group and the glycerol, makes up the hydrophilic head because it contains polar functional groups with the highly electronegative nitrogen and oxygen atoms. This down here where the fatty acids are makes up the hydrophobic tail. And so phospholipids are special in that it is made up of both a hydrophilic region and a hydrophobic region. Glycolipids also help to form and maintain the cell membrane and membranes of organelles. The difference between glycolipids and phospholipids is that the hydrophilic head is made up of a carbohydrate group. So these hexagons here represent the six atom rings found in simple sugars or monosaccharides. Steroids are another important type of lipid and it's not like the others because of its structure. It has four rings that are fused together. And because the rings are made up of carbon and hydrogen atoms, steroids are hydrophobic and insoluble in water, which is why it's considered a lipid. All steroids have the same basic structure of the four fused rings. The only difference between the various types of steroids is based on which functional groups are attached to the rings. The most common steroid is cholesterol, which is what is shown here. Cholesterol is another important component found in cell membranes, as well as in bile, which is needed for the digestion of lipids. It is also a precursor for other important steroids such as vitamin D and hormones like estrogen and testosterone. You often hear about eating healthy and exercising regularly, as this will keep your cholesterol levels low. This is because High cholesterol levels can lead to an increased risk of cardiovascular diseases, but not all cholesterol is bad. There are good cholesterol that are found in something called HDL, which stands for high density lipoprotein. 
Lipoproteins are responsible for transporting the cholesterol throughout the blood. The bad cholesterol are the ones found in LDL, which stands for low density lipoprotein. When there's too much LDL and cholesterol circulating in the blood, they can stick to the walls of the artery, forming plaques that can block the blood vessel. Whereas the HDL pick up excess cholesterol in the blood and transports them to the liver where it will be removed from the body. This is why they refer to it as the good cholesterol. Blood tests can include a measurement of the total blood cholesterol levels as well as the good and bad cholesterol levels. Higher HDL values have shown to decrease the risk of cardiovascular diseases, but higher LDL values have shown to increase the risks. In the presence of water, phospholipids are able to form membranes in cell walls and also membranes around organelles inside cells. What happens is that the hydrophilic heads line up next to each other and point towards the water because they're attracted to each other. Whereas the hydrophobic tails line up next to each other and point away from the water. In doing so, a phospholipid layer is formed. A second layer is also formed with the hydrophobic tails pointing towards the hydrophobic tails in the first layer and the hydrophilic heads pointing towards the water inside the cell. So together, the two layers form a phospholipid bilayer and is able to separate the two different water solutions. There's the water solution inside the cell and then there's the water solution outside the cell. It's also able to control what substances can pass through the cell membrane. Here's a more detailed image of a cross-section of a cell wall. So here we have the phospholipid bilayer and dispersed through the bilayer you have the glycolipids. What we're seeing here are the carbohydrate chains as well as the cholesterol or the steroids which is here shown in yellow. So with this phospholipid bilayer, it's able to separate out the solution that's within the cell from the solution that is outside of the cell. When there's a large number of phospholipids and glycolipids in water, they tend to form something called micelles. Micelles are sphere-shaped aggregates as shown here, with the hydrophilic heads pointing towards the outside because they're attracted to the water whereas the hydrophobic tails are on the inside, hiding from the water. My cells are actually very important in the digestion and absorption of fats. As the food we eat is broken down in the digestive tract, my cells will form and the fats from the food that we eat will get trapped in the middle because they would be attracted to the hydrophobic tails. So you can envision the fat stored here in the middle. The micelles carrying the fats can then be absorbed by the body. Watch this animation of what happens to fatty acids when they are added to water. The white represents the non-polar hydrocarbon tail and the red and blue represent the polar carboxylic acid group. Notice how the non-polar tails aggregate together in the center and leave the polar heads exposed on the outside to the water. This is how a micelle is formed. What do you think would happen if, instead of using water, fatty acids were added to oil? The correct answer is that the fatty acids would flip to expose the hydrophobic tails to the oil, and the hydrophilic heads would hide in the center. This is because the polar heads would not be attracted to the oil, but the tails would be able to interact with the oil since they are both nonpolar. Remember that like dissolves like. What we're seeing here is what we call a reverse micelle.
The final major category of biomolecules are nucleic acids. There are two types depending on the sugar that is attached. There are deoxyribonucleic acids, known as DNA, and ribonucleic acids, known as RNA. Nucleic acid is made up of a long chain of monomers called nucleotides, and the atoms found in the large molecules are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. The main role of the nucleic acids is to store, transfer, and express genetic information, in particular, the information needed to create proteins in the cell. Nucleotides have a general structure that includes one negatively charged phosphate group, a five carbon sugar ring, and a nitrogenous base. For the ring, DNA contains a deoxyribose sugar, whereas for RNA, it contains a ribose sugar. The only difference between the two rings is that in RNA, it has an extra oxygen found here in the hydroxyl group. For the nitrogenous base, there are five different ones separated into two types. There are the pyrimidines, as shown here, cysteine, thymine, and uracil. The first initials of the bases are often used to represent nucleotides in an image of DNA or RNA. The other type is called the purines, so that includes adenine and guanine. All pyrimidines and purines can be found in DNA or RNA, except for uracil and thymine. Uracil can only be found in RNA, whereas thymine will only be found in DNA. The dehydration synthesis reaction is also used to link together the monomers to create the polymer. Here, the water molecules formed come from removing a hydrogen from a phosphate group in one nucleotide. So this is a nucleotide with a nitrogenous base, the sugar, and the phosphate group. So here is the hydrogen from the phosphate group. And it reacts with the hydroxyl group here off the sugar in a neighboring nucleotide. So together, it creates a new bond linking together the nucleotides. And when several nucleotides are linked together, the position of the linkages ends up creating a sugar phosphate backbone. And the nitrogenous bases ends up pointing towards one side. This becomes important in the three-dimensional shape of the nucleic acids. With the bases in one nucleic acid strand pointing along one side, it can actually hydrogen bond with bases from another nucleic acid strand. This results in the twisting of the two strands into the distinct spiral staircase shape of DNA, also known as a double helix. Notice that adenine is always paired with thymine in DNA. So here you can see that A is always paired with T, as shown here in the double helix. And when the two pair up, two hydrogen bonds can form. Cytosine is always paired with guanine. And in doing so, three hydrogen bonds can form. So you can see in the double helix that cytosine is always with guanine. RNA is made up of only one strand of nucleotides, and so the shape of RNA depends on the order of the nucleotides and the subsequent interactions between them. Since the two strands of DNA are held together through hydrogen bonding, if DNA was exposed to higher temperatures, the hydrogen bonds would actually be disrupted. What would happen is that the strands of nucleic acids would separate. Notice, though, that the nucleic acids do not fall apart into the individual atoms. This is because the covalent bonds are very strong, and they wouldn't break, unlike the hydrogen bonding interactions. So in summary, there are four major categories of biomolecules. There are proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. We also look at the various types of polymers, or large macromolecules, and the monomers that were linked together to create them. 
The examples we saw included proteins made up of amino acids, polysaccharides such as starch and cellulose made up of simple sugars, lipids made up of fatty acids and glycerol, and nucleic acids made up of nucleotides. All the polymers are made from the dehydration synthesis reaction between monomers. So when monomers are linked together and creating a new covalent bond, water is always formed as one of the products. There is always a hydrogen from one monomer that reacts with a hydroxyl group from a neighboring monomer. Biomolecules play very important roles in living organisms, from forming and maintaining cell structure, sending signals throughout the body, facilitating biological processes, to being a source of energy. Without them, we would cease to exist.